Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Drew Galloway here on a Tuesday. Not a whole lot for you on Monday, uh, as everybody is still kind of getting back into the scene of being uh, back home and from Utah after uh, a not-so-fun weekend in terms of what took place on the field. And there was a lot going on yesterday with K-State because Chris Kleiman had his usual Monday press conference, so there was that. But in addition, Jerome Tang had his first press conference of essentially the 24-25 season as uh, practice has officially got underway for college basketball. And so he was able to kind of give his thoughts on the team. And, you know, it's, at times it can be a little sporadic when we get to hear from Jerome Tang. So it was good to get some basketball information coming in. And so far, everything on that front seems to be heading in the same direction that it was hinted at throughout the entirety of the offseason. So we'll get to all that in just a moment and give you the thoughts and the recaps on everything that went down there. But first, good reminder for everybody that if you want to join your Wildcats in Ireland as they kick off the 2025 football season against Iowa State and the Aer Lingus College Football Classic, you can get game tickets by securing them through a travel or hospitality package. All-inclusive travel packages include premium game tickets, luxury hotel accommodations, an exclusive K-State welcome experience, and more. Game day hospitality packages include premium in-stadium hospitality with food and drinks and premium game tickets. Don't miss out on the trip of a lifetime. Book your packages now at cats2ireland.com. That's cats, the number two, ireland.com. And it'd be a good idea to do it so you don't miss out on that kind of trip because I think there are a lot of people, even despite the outcome, which makes it a little bit tougher to enjoy the environment. There's going to be a lot of people that if you talk to your friends or anybody that you knew that went to Provo, they're going to say, yeah, you should really get there sometime. Like that would be a road trip in the big 12 that you want to try and make. And yeah. I don't, I don't know that there were a lot before that, that you would have said that about. I mean, Oklahoma probably would have been in the mix there. Pretty good environment. Uh, and, you know, K-State had some solid success there. Um, I just don't know that the Big 12 has had a ton uh, in recent years where you've been like, oh, you got to go check out a road game there. Colorado being back probably brings some of that in, but some of that's nostalgia and, and the the location that it's in. Um, I guess I'll, I'll throw this out to you. Prior to BYU, uh, what do you think is the most sought-after destination for a road Big 12 football game if you're a K-State fan? Wow, that that's actually a really good question. Because the and one my whole I, point there was don't miss out on not going to Ireland because K-State will be back in Provo in like three years. Uh, I don't the, know that they'll ever be back in Ireland to play a football game. <laughs> the the one that I was going to say isn't even one that I think that most people like seek after, but every time that K-State's gone to Lubbock football or basketball, like I've had a good experience and have really enjoyed the crowds there. Uh, I was going to say until also until you brought up like football, I was going to say if you thought that going to Provo for football was so fun, go during basketball season. In case it, it's a road only game in Provo this year. So okay. if, it, if it's a weekend game, I feel like that would be kind of a game that everybody should go to because I've heard that the basketball crowd is just as wild as the football one. I can't imagine it's as replicable as, you know, what they could do with in, inside that football stadium and with the setting outside and everything, because uh, it really was a perfect night aside from the Cats getting their butts smacked by 29 points, which uh, was, you know, part of what Chris Kleiman had to talk about yesterday. So what what was the general vibe of the press conference for Chris Kleiman? Because when you come off these losses, it's a combination of, not trying to focus too much on what happened during the loss, but also understanding that you do have to take some stuff away from it. You can't just avoid watching the film from that game. You know, like that's not something that you're going to do. Um, at least any well-respected and good football coach in America and certainly in the state of Kansas, I can't imagine anybody else would, would say we're going to turn it off. So what was the feel that you got from Chris Kleiman yesterday? Uh, the feel that I got generally, sorry, I just looked outside and it is like pouring down rain all of a sudden. So uh, got distracted a little bit there. Um, but you, the general vibe yesterday was just kind of knowing that Saturday was bad and that you are just looking forward to kind of washing that away by playing well on sat this upcoming Saturday. I mean, I, I put in the rapid recap yesterday. I, I 
it was like the general theme was Chris Kleiman saying that he is looking forward to the response of this team and kind of looking forward to how uh, this weekend goes because he knows that they're in a spot where they need to respond and need to respond well. And, and you look in the Chris Kleiman era, K-State hasn't lost back-to-back games super often, especially from 2021 on. I, it, it's really been a one game and then you bounce back and you probably win the next game. And, and I'd like to look into it a little bit more and probably will later on in the week. But it kind of feels like when K-State loses, they kind of beat the crap out of the next opponent. At least it has felt like that recently. Uh, so I think that it was just about knowing that yesterday or last week was bad at BYU and, and that that's behind you. And now it's okay. It's a one week season again against Oklahoma state. And, and also like everything that could possibly go wrong went wrong in Provo. And, and I think that Chris Kleiman knows that and, and probably knows that nothing like that will likely happen again. Yeah. There, there is some semi fluky nature to uh, how things played out. And just uh, to, to kind of back up what you're saying, last year after the loss to Missouri, K-State bounced back, beat UCF by 13. And that was actually UCF scored late in the game, so it was really like a three-score game. Uh, after the loss to Oklahoma State, they went on the road to Lubbock, like you mentioned, won by 17. And after the loss to Texas, they won by 34 at home against Baylor. Uh, similar situation where Baylor also dumped in a garbage time score. And then after the uh, Iowa State loss, they bounced back a month later in the Pop-Tarts Bowl, and they basically controlled start to finish in that game. The year prior, the loss to Tulane, they won by seven at OU. Uh, The loss at TCU, they won by 48 at home against Oklahoma State. And then they went on the road and beat Baylor by 28 after the loss to Texas. Uh, In 2021, different circumstances. They lost three straight with O-State, Oklahoma, and Iowa State. Um, obviously, we know that Oklahoma State game that uh, Skylar Thompson didn't play, and it was Jaron Lewis for most of the game. Um, but they they came through pretty strong there. So um, they, they've done a nice job of bouncing back in these situations. There was It was weird early on in Kleiman's stretch when they lost the game, they did lose two consecutive at least. Like year one, they won their games in spurts. It was like they won three, lost two, won three, lost two. Uh, and I think that uh, they've probably learned a little bit better about how to get past that, and I think that just shows that they're stronger as a program now where they sit in terms of having the guys that are more understanding of what they need to do to overcome that, and they've also built out just some better depth that makes them a little less susceptible to that happening, and I think you know, having Oklahoma State come in here after a loss like that and you consider what K-State did two years ago when Oklahoma State came to Manhattan, coming off of a road loss, a little bit of a different circumstance and everything. Um, but still, I think that there can be some parallels. I kind of think K-State is set up to be in a, a position very similar to 2022. Like, it's early in the week, but and I know that that one Oklahoma State poster that w- watches all of our videos that hates us for dumping on the Cowboys, um, there's a part of me that thinks that 2022 might replicate itself in some way on Saturday. Like I think K state is set up in a better position right now than Oklahoma state as a team. And I think that, you know, they'll be highly motivated. They'll have the home crowd. And uh, I think that you get a pretty strong performance out of them. Yeah. The, the vibe was still kind of like that pissed off of how they played because we talked on Sunday, we talked Saturday, we, we've talked pretty much all week about how, yes, BYU forced Casey into those mistakes, but if you look at the drives that BYU's offense had when they actually had to, what I like to call it, do it themselves, BYU wasn't really doing anything. And, and I think that that kind of has irked K-State's locker room and kind of the coaching staff a little bit because you you don't make those mistakes and turn the ball over. K-State probably wins that game, maybe even going away. Like, it, it was 6 nothing with, like, four minutes to go in the second quarter, and it felt like K-State was dominating the game, even though it was 6 to nothing. So I, I think that there is kind of that sense of we are not that bad to lose by 29 points at BYU. 
and, and to be honest, you're probably not that good to beat Arizona the way that they did uh, on that Friday night. So you need to be somewhere in that middle ground. And I think that that's probably where you'll get. In. But I do think that this will this has potential to be the best that K State has played all season. If you look at how they played and kind of the general attitude and how everything I think is kind of lining up for K-State to go. But the same could be said about Oklahoma State because I think that this will this will be a game of two very highly motivated teams because of how how they've played recently. Because neither team really let, lit the world on fire uh, last week. Oklahoma State scored two garbage time TDs to make it a three-point game. But they were getting manhandled that entire game as well. Yeah, you you're right about that. Uh, although I would say that I think Oklahoma State has some more concerning problems right now than K State because we can look at K State and see that their problems are you're really young in a lot of areas on offense, and you have a new offensive coordinator, and that's really where the root of a lot of these problems are coming from. In addition, to just some flukiness in that game with uh, BYU because if you if you think about it and you you can't say it for certain because you know the game played out how the game played out, but DJ Giddens his fumble started the avalanche. We talked about it. DJ Giddens had never fumbled before at K State. It's not something that he does. He takes a ton of hits, and that you would think, oh, that ball could pop out. It never has, and it comes out at the wrong time. And BYU picks it up in the right spot, takes it back for a score. If that doesn't happen. There's also, in my opinion, a very real chance that Avery Johnson doesn't throw those two interceptions because of the way that the game played out. And then that punt return touchdown, also just a very fluky play. That was not Dylan Edwards fielding it on a clean hop to him against Arizona and setting it up like every normal return ever. It was the punt returner misplayed the ball. It bounces off of his hands, and he runs straight backwards to scoop it up and basically does a giant U-turn going back towards the end zone, and K-State is tripping their own guys and all this other stuff, and he takes it back for a touchdown. Like, it's easier to paint that picture than if you look at Oklahoma State and you see that they've got a 24th-year quarterback that got benched against Utah, who is without their 24th-year quarterback and playing Zach Wilson's little brother, who wasn't fantastic by any stretch of the Im imagination. Like, Utah has not looked very good or dominant when they have been without Cam Rising the last two seasons. And that continued on Saturday because it gave Oklahoma State a chance there. Ollie Gordon has not been right at any point yet this season. And there, you know, there are some concerns there about the Oklahoma State defense, which you would think would be better. Um, and and they've struggled at certain points against really teams not named Tulsa. Um, so I think that there are, are things where Oklahoma State has more long-term problems right now than what K-State does. And this kind of goes back to the Tulane game situation where the, the fixes are small to get K-State going in the right direction with the defense is what they talked about. With the offense, it's the same kind of deal. It might take longer there because it's getting your head kind of screwed on straight for these guys and really getting fully adjusted. But when it happens or even as it progresses a little bit, you should see a massive difference for how they, they played in that BYU game. And also look around, like, the three games not in the BYU situation, while there have been issues with the offense, they've had stretches where they were able to get it figured out and dominate that game and do enough. And even with some of the new pieces come along, they have had their moments. Like, Avery Johnson only had one turnover in the first three games of the season. He threw that pick against UT Martin, but he was clean against Tulane. He was clean against Arizona. The offensive line had moments where they were good in certain games this season. And, you know, Sam Hecht was coming off of playing his best game against Arizona, possibly. So there's a lot more, I think, to be optimistic on with the K-State situation than Oklahoma State right now. But we'll see uh, ultimately how that ends up playing out. One thing that could hamper the K-State offense is Braden Lofton's absence because we know how important the tight ends have been. And maybe that's another reason why K-State struggled when they got down deep into BYU territory on Saturday is because of how limited the tight ends were. You had Garrett Oakley who was banged up going in. Braden Lofton suffered what appeared to be a right leg injury over the course of the game, uh, and he didn't play all that much. Uh, what did Chris Kleiman have to share on Braden Lofton yesterday? Yeah, and uh, he, he ended up saying that it's not a season-ending injury, but Lofton will be out a few weeks. 
and that, that's a big loss. I mean, that, that's the team leader and receiving touchdowns right now, the third leading receiver total, and, and a guy that's really been emerging and as a, as a young player because he's only still a redshirt sophomore. So that, that's valuable game experience and game reps and kind of like what you've talked about. Garrett Oakley has been a little bit dinged up. So that kind of has led K State to be, go even deeper down in the depth chart at tight end. So I, I know that they're really excited about Andrew Metzger and, and Will Ancio, but they're both redshirt freshmen. So you're not like super certain that they're ready to go right now. So the hope is that you can get Garrett Oakley closer to 100% this week and then Will Swanson. And then you just see where Braden Lofton is at post bye week. Uh, but I mean, it, it's it's a loss and kind of just back to general thoughts about the offense, too. I, I think that there are moments that you can see that K-State's offense is like right there. And a lot of it, I think, will just take game experience and game reps uh, because you, you look back and you rewatch that that game. And there are a few times where Avery Johnson missed open receivers and just didn't throw the ball. There are still times where I think he throw or he holds on to it too long before he throws it deep. And, and I think that there are some times where he just overthrows guys by like one or two steps. And that's a situation where you just got to give your guy a chance. And, and I think that that's something that will just come with time and come with more game experience and game reps. So, and, and I mean, Chris Klein kind of said the same thing yesterday, just that he has full belief in Avery and that he knows that he'll get it figured out. And that last week was bad. But I think that that could be one of the worst games that Avery plays all season long. So it, 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 he has taken a step in, from week one to week two, week two to week three. This is his first kind of step back. So I'm excited to see how he responds to that. And, and I would like to see some of those timing throws just be a little bit better and a little bit more crisp. Because, again, half the time on these deep throws... I would just like him to give his receiver a chance, like when he missed uh, Jaden Jackson in the BYU game. And that's that's one where he just has to give Jackson a chance because he had his guy beat. And then he had Jace Brown on a deep ball in the second half. And if he would have thrown it probably two or three seconds earlier, it's a touchdown. And instead, he waited. And because of that, it was incomplete. Yeah, that that's, that's a good point. And I think, again, that's one of those things, too, where it's tough for – probably a young quarterback to be just have that trust and faith number one in any circumstance for your uh, receivers and just putting it out there. But number two, especially when his receivers haven't really shown him that much yet this year, like I, I have no doubt that that's how he thinks about it in general, but I do think in terms of processing, you, you do make decisions based off of, do I think somebody can handle this? Do I think that they can do this? And most of the time, like if it's not, then you're like, eh, split second decision. I'm not going to do that. So I think it, for him right now, we've seen a lot of it needs to be there for him to do it as opposed to it should be there. Let me try. And that would be the one thing that I'd be a little concerned about uh, with what happened in the BYU game is I think he had a moment where he had the it should be there on the screen pass to Dylan Edwards. And for whatever reason, he and Dylan were not on the same page or it wasn't where he needed to be and stuff broke down there. Hopefully that doesn't have long-term effects uh, in terms of him going even further back and, and waiting to, to throw it where it, it should go and where guys should be as opposed to where they actually are in the moment. So it'll be interesting to see how he responds uh, in terms of the passing game on Saturday against Oklahoma State. What, uh, what else from Chris Kleiman yesterday stood out to you? Uh, I think that it was just, uh, just knowing that they need to get better and just not being afraid to say that and that they need to get better at turning the ball over or, uh, turning teams over. Yeah. Excuse me. They, they I, I, believe me, I think they're pretty good at turning the ball over after they, Saturday. They need to get better at turning teams over, uh, because they've only had three forced turnovers in four games and. If you are sputtering on offense a little bit with lacking rhythm and consistency, the, the best thing that you can do is give them a short field. BYU's offense this year has been pretty terrible, to, to be completely honest with you. And what does BYU's defense do for them last week? Turn K-State over. Mm -hmm. K-State turned the ball over three times and missed two fourth down conversions. I mean, you count that as five turnovers. And K-State's defense couldn't do that to BYU. 
And, and that's a that's a big deal. And when K State's offense turns the ball over, the the thing that you would like K State's defense to do isn't even forcing another turnover right back, but you can force a field goal. And K State's defense didn't do that. So I think it's you kind of got to see the defensive mind of Chris Kleiman because the question was about uh, the offense's turnovers uh, on Saturday, and he said that like they that he knows that they need to do better at taking care of the ball in that situation but also that the defense could help the offense out and the defense didn't do that. They need to do a better job of complimentary football. And, and in a game like that, where we kind of, we talked about kind of all week leading into the game that the perfect storm for like a BYU win was if K-State couldn't take care of the ball and didn't win in the margins. And they didn't do that. Yeah. And K-State still isn't good enough to not win in the margins and not win the turnover battle uh, to win a lot of games. Well, and and really, nobody is gonna ever win for the most part win a game when it's that severe. Like it was, it was three nothing in the turnover department, and one of them was an instant score, and the other two led to touchdowns. So it's not like it was, you know, just one of those games where, oh, yeah, you lost by two. Because you'll see teams sometimes turn it over twice. K State against UT Martin, and it doesn't impact the course of the game, uh, even in some games with better teams. Like it can happen, and it won't matter much, but. And this one, it uh, it certainly did. So let's shift gears, go to the basketball side of things because Jerome Tang got to talk. Uh, and again, he seems to be pretty optimistic about his team this season. I'd be in that same boat. Um, I don't know. I, it's probably tougher to, to be more optimistic than Jerome Tang. I might be, though, about this team. I have some really high expectations and thoughts for what they could achieve. And uh, maybe one of the places where that's going to start this year for K-State is what he had to say about Doug McDaniel and David Castillo yesterday. Uh, two guys for different reasons that might be willing to, to play a big role this year, um, but kind of give us the, the lowdown on what Jerome Tang said about two of his guards uh, that are in different points of their basketball career. Doug McDaniel on his second college team, becoming a veteran now, and then David Castillo, who's yet to play in a college basketball game. Ooh, I was going to say two of his smaller guards. because That too, they're tiny. Doug and Dave are, are not, not big guys. Uh, but he said that uh, Doug McDaniel has done pretty much anything that Casey has asked him to do from a leadership standpoint, from a point guard standpoint, and that he is just a guy that comes to practice ready to go and is always willing to learn new things and to kind of take it all in and really go out and play. And, and it was a, it was a funny analogy, but he said that if uh Doug McDaniel played football and played corner. He wouldn't let the receiver catch the ball. And if he played receiver, he'd always try and get open because he's just that that competitive and that ready to go. So you kind of look at that, and, and that's kind of what you see uh, with Doug McDaniel's the fiery competitiveness and, and a very fast guard that can do a little bit of everything. So it, it's always nice to hear that like one of the bigger portal additions of the entire team, which – by the way, still feels kind of like that was a very underrated addition because it happened so early in the process that people kind of forget how good Doug McDaniel is. So it, it's good to hear uh, Jerome Tang really hype him up and talk about him. And then just talking about David Castillo, again, that was, that was an addition that happened so long ago that it kind of got really swept under the rug when he finally got to campus and kind of got to go through all summer and go through workouts. But uh Castillo has won at every single level in basketball that he's been at so far high school uh going to prep school uh playing for USA basketball he's won two gold medals and when he didn't play in the U18 uh the US didn't even medal so I mean he's just a winner and does anything that he can and uh the most encouraging thing though that I think that he said about David Castillo was that he has championship level habits and like has the work ethic of a pro. Like, I don't think that David Castillo is a guy that will be satisfied at any point in his career. And, and the more that you kind of hear about David Castillo, it, I think it's going to be tough for him to not see the floor a lot. And, and I think that, I think that that's a good thing because if he is able to play and play at a pretty good, good clip and play at a high level, that really increases the ceiling of K-State's team because that gives them another lead guard that can go and do a lot of things. 
Well, and I, I his yeah his skill set that he has is is going to be impactful too. So like it's he's got tools that would be needed by any team, uh, and so if he's able to play at the level that it takes for a freshman to see the floor like that, then that's that's big time because there's a difference. I, I have no doubt if Castillo was on last year's team, he's playing a lot. Um, that, there's a chance he plays more than Day Day Ames on last year's team, who was the you know the top freshman minutes guy. And on this team, it might be a little bit tougher, but I think that at the end of the day, it sounds like they think Castillo is going to be prepared, and that's kind of been the buzz all throughout this, and it hasn't slowed down now as they get closer to doing more and more as a team. Um, I, I, I'm i pretty excited to see what what can come from him. And he adds to you know his, his high school shooting numbers are good, but this is a team that is going to be able to shoot better this year from the outside for K-State, and that's the thing where so many people last year kind of would dump on the offense. And I certainly would at times too, but the offense was bad last year, not necessarily from what they were trying to do, but from the guys they had that couldn't execute it. Like they got the looks that you want out of an offense, but they either missed it a lot or they decided they had to pass that up and take the offense's flow out of it because they had guys that couldn't make a certain shot. And that made them a lot easier to defend. So uh, he certainly will help with a lot of that this year if he can see the floor, and that would be uh, good news for K-State. Another guy that got high praise yesterday was David Gasson, who you know he, he transferred in here, was one of the first Jerome Tang players, and here he sits year three, his last year with K-State. Uh, what did Jerome Tang have to say about his uh, Dutch center? Or forward, I guess wing they'll call him. Uh, it's weird, by the way, who got designations as wings and – uh, centers and everything on the uh, on the basketball roster because we were talking about this. Uganda and Yinso is listed as a center, but nobody else gets that designation. The other big guys, they are strictly listed as wings. That includes uh, by fall, which was somewhat surprising to me. But uh, what we can talk about David Gasson here and uh, what he might bring to the table this year. Yeah, the Flying Dutchman, if you will. Uh, he is the guy that's kind of been kind of all that Marquis Noel ish Masood level of like, he is one of three guys that are, that are returners from last year. And he's the one that's kind of brought everybody together and has kind of shown everybody the ropes because this is his third year in the program. And he kind of knows what it's all about and knows what to do every day. Uh, I believe it was, uh, Yorick Malagi on three Ma talked about that. Uh, David Gasson is the embodiment of their program because he's been there since they've been there. And you can kind of see how much that Gasson has grown and that he just has a lot of confidence right now and confidence in himself, confidence. And, and I think that that really shows when you're the guy and, and he is going to be one of the biggest leaders on the team and is going to be really counted on to, especially in this first, like, the, I think yesterday's 43 days until the first game. In these next 42 days, he is the guy that is going to know all of the drills, know all of the practice stuff, and be the one to really tell everybody, hey, like that's not what we do here. And, and I think that that's good to hear because David Gasson is not exactly the most vocal guy all the time. So to hear that he is taking on that leadership role, I think it was very exciting to hear and uh, is something that, you would like because in, a, in an ideal world, you would want one of your three returning guys to be like that big leader and to really step up. Yeah, and I, I think it's good. I think we've seen David Gasson get more comfortable in a lot of different ways uh, as he continues to be at K-State. I think this I think this coaching staff has really motivated him and empowered him to, to do that. But I also just think that he's had that in him and now – with growing confidence, which uh, like I think he should go out and get more of. I think it's it's beneficial. We've we've seen some really good things from David Gasson, and this team is going to need um, a leader that fully understands what the coaches are saying and what you kind of have to do at K State. Because you know, in, in my opinion, I think Coleman Hawkins is going to be a really good thing for this team, not just as the player that he'll be on the floor, but he's a guy that's coming in here, and when the season tips off. Will have only spent what will that end up being like 
two and a half, three months with like Jerome Tang and this team, um, it's going to be helpful to have a guy like David Gasson that's been there from start to finish with Jerome Tang at K-State. So I, I think that he's, he's good to have uh, in that position. What else did Jerome Tang have yesterday that stood out to you about what this uh, K-State basketball team might have when they tip off the season in the uh, just a little over a month with the official start date? Yeah, and we get a conference basketball schedule on Thursday, finally. So mm. we're, we're getting somewhere. Uh, but it is wild that we're like less than a month and a half away and we still don't have a conference schedule. That That's, a, that's another topic for another day. Uh, but the, the thing that was fun to hear from my perspective too, was just about the versatility on this K state roster. And like, we, we knew, uh, how versatile it can be and that they have a lot of guys that can do a lot of different things, uh, lots of length. Uh, but it, it was nice to hear that this kind of is an ideal roster for Jerome Tang, but that he isn't married to like one particular style. So if there are, if there's a game or a team that he has a, the four of the five best players are guards. He's going to play four guards. If there's a team or a game or a, even a week or two stretch that there's four forwards in the starting five, that's what he's going to do. And, and it's nice to hear that like he just wants to win so bad that he's going to find a combination of the five best players on the floor and they're going to make it work. And, and you would hope that a lot of coaches would do that but to hear that from Jerome Tang yesterday of, hey, like we have a style of basketball that we want to play, but also if our roster is really good at one position, but probably is weaker in another, we're going to play to our strengths. And, and I think that that's a good thing. And you don't always hear that because sometimes you can see coaches that get a little too married in their particular style and don't adjust to what they have around them. Well, and a lot of teams don't have the ability to truly be as versatile as K State might able to be might be able to be this upcoming year because they are going to have some of these bigger guys that with their length can still handle the ball for you or do some of these things where um they they're going to be able to get really creative at times this season and that'll be pretty fun to kind of watch and see uh with how it all unfolds. So that's the lowdown there on Chris Kleiman and Jerome Tang, both getting some Monday with the media action. And uh, we'll hear from Chris Kleiman again on Saturday after the game. Don't know the next time that we'll get to hear from Jerome Tang, but certainly more basketball stuff coming in uh, the next few days and weeks, especially with what we anticipate being a basketball schedule soon since the Big 12 finalized their deal with CBS to add more games on linear TV, not just on CBS, but mainly on CBS Sports Network, uh, which the, the Big East has had uh, a deal with in the past uh, couple of years. So it's uh, it, it'll be good for those that despise ESPN+. Plus. You're going to have more games that are actually on a TV channel that you can go out and find. Uh, one last thing that I wanted to do before we got out of here was back in uh, probably July, uh, we drafted our teams in Big 12 football to kind of keep stock of them. And it was me, Drew, D.Y., and Fan all going through. I've been keeping track of the points now. Yes, I went back. I listened. I found what our grading criteria was. Um, as a reminder, we each took four teams, basically all of them in the same, in, in the same levels. Uh, for, you know, we kind of had a Tier 1 perceived going in, a Tier 2, Tier 3, Tier 4. And you get a point for a win, a point for a top 25 win, one point for every three-game win streak you go on because building momentum is important in college football. You get a point once you become bowl eligible. You get a point for a bowl win, two points if you play in the Big 12 title game, four points if you win the Big 12 title, uh, four, point, four more points for a college football playoff appearance, five points if you win a game in the college football playoff, and then uh, every out-of-conference power four win was worth one point. Um, just to update that, Drew is sitting in a nice position right now with 19 points. Um, his teams are all at 500 or better. He has Baylor, Arizona State, Iowa State, and K-State. Um, so he had three of his teams get to three-game win streaks, so he's at a total of 19 points right now. Uh, we'll fall off quickly with Baylor there. 
Yeah, yeah, they could. They, yeah, you might be done with getting any points for what Baylor does. Fan is in second with 17. Also a guy that uh, is probably done getting points from Cincinnati, and who knows how many more he's going to get from TCU. Uh, but he has Utah and UCF. Drew, by the way, K-State, Iowa State, Baylor, and Arizona State. D.Y. in a bad spot, and he had a pretty bad weekend. Uh, he's got Oklahoma State, KU, Colorado, and Houston. So Colorado Ooh. was the only one to get a point for him. Now, it would be big for him if Colorado wins this weekend. That would be their third straight. Uh, actually, no, I guess that wouldn't be their third straight, would it? Well, no, it would be. be their third straight win, so he would get essentially two points for a win over UCF. Uh, and then I had a good weekend. Would have been better if Arizona had decided to just play somebody this week. Uh, they were by. But Tech, West Virginia, and BYU all got wins, including BYU, who uh, got a top 25 win over K-State. So I unfortunately benefited from that. So the current standings, Drew with 19 points, Fan with 17, me with 14, and DY with 10. Uh, so we'll continue to monitor that throughout the entirety of the season. But that is how things sit right now. Uh, any thoughts on the Big 12 and how it sits, especially since – on the Sunday show, we didn't talk Big 12 with fan because I think we were kind of sick of the airport and also just kind of done talking about football after uh, what we saw Saturday night. Yeah, just another weird week in the Big 12, and I don't expect this week to be any more normal. Like, you know, I I, I might not predict it like right now, but I kind of get the vibe that Baylor actually might beat BYU in, in – I think that that wouldn't be the most surprising thing after kind of how both teams are. It's either going to end in a, there's two options. I think Baylor either beats BYU or BYU beats Baylor by like 20. Like, because you could see Baylor quitting after how they lost to Colorado or BYU coming in and coming in a little too hot and feeling themselves and losing to Baylor. Uh, the other thing I was going to say is that uh, we need to do another draft before basketball starts. And that's that is a great on. point. I love that. Yep, uh, we do need to do it for basketball. Uh, so we will get on that. We'll organize that at some point. Um, that might be a good thing to do during the the bye week for football coming up. So next week, sometime, whether we do it on uh, Sunday or sometime during the week, but that. That's a good idea. So we will we will do the basketball version of this at some point. Basketball will be even more fun, more games, uh, more opportunities for some of those big wins that can kind of up your resume for everybody. So, yeah, we will definitely do that and uh, keep everything updated as things move forward. And at some point, I'll be better organized about it, and I can actually put graphics up on the, the YouTube video for everybody. So that'll do it for us today. We'll be back again tomorrow. Based on the way things are going, tomorrow will be a recruiting update with Drew. So we'll talk recruiting on a Wednesday and then D.Y. and I, I think, on Thursday, as long as uh, everything's going fine there. Uh, we'll recap what the coordinators had to say and probably talk Big 12 basketball schedule uh, because, again, there's some hope that it comes out sometime this week. And then Friday, regular pregame show as always, and then Saturday, your game day content. So that's kind of the lineup for the week, but that'll do it for us now at KSO. So for Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Vo. Thanks for watching and listening to K-State Online. You can always find us over at On3.